So, the first worked example. Here we've got a two degree of freedom system. One kilogram, two kilogram, connected by springs. They're all of the same stiffness, one kilonewton per meter. And we have a, sin, uh, a sinusoidal forcing function applied to this mass. Okay, and the question is, what's the response of the system? Obviously, the response will depend upon our driving frequency, omega, but let's not worry too much about what that value is right now. Okay, well, in fact, I've been given those terms. P1, my amplitude is 10 newtons, and omega is 2 pi times by 6, so 12, 12 pi radians per second, okay, 6 hertz, and that's applied to the 1 kilogram mass. So step one, determine the equation of motion. Well, it's quite clear that if I go through quick method, I've got one and two, x1 double dot, x2 double dot, and then for my the springs, obviously I've got, um, if I look at the first mass, if we go back, some of the springs connecting each mass to ground or to another mass, well, obviously, quite clearly for mass one, it's one plus one, and for mass two, it's one plus one, so I get, also get two. And, and then... The off diagonals is the minus the sum of the springs connecting each mass to each other. Well, obviously, I've got a 2 by 2, so there's only one spot on each side that needs solving, and it's obviously going to be minus 1. So uh, that's my. Obviously, it was in kilonewtons per meter, hence the reason it's 2,000 and 1,000 as opposed to 2 and 1. There's my equation of motion. I find the mechanical impedance matrix, take the determinant to get my natural frequencies. I end up with a quadratic in terms of omega, omega squared. And I can find the natural frequencies, okay, um, 1,500 plus or minus 0.5 times 3,000, the square root of 3,000. And so if I go through, I end up getting 25.18 radians per second for one of them, and then 68.46 radians per second for the other one, and that translates to 4 hertz or 7.7 .7 hertz. And so if I had my system, okay, and I was driving it at 4 hertz, I'd get one natural frequency. Okay, you can imagine with such a system, you might get the modes oscillating like this. The other mode would be oscillating like this. Okay, And one would be at 4 hertz, and one would be at 7.7 .7 hertz. So that's my natural frequencies. I plug that back into my mechanical impedance matrix, and I'll get um, my mode shapes. What I've done in this case is I've actually, I've actually scaled the mode shape so that, such that x2 is 1 and I find the relative motion of x1, okay? It doesn't really matter. This is exactly what I found um, in the previous, uh, you know, when we were doing it before, when we were scaling x1 to be 1. Here, I've just done it for x2, as a, uh, argu you know, for the sake of argument. And I end up getting two modes, 0.732 and 1, okay? And the other mode is minus 2.732 and 1. So as I predicted, one mode, you've got the masses moving in the same direction, okay? M Mass 1 is not moving as much as mass 2, okay, but they're, they're moving in the same direction, and the other one, I've got them moving in opposite directions, okay, at the higher frequency. That we've done before. That's step 1, 2, and 3 is all last chapter. Step 4, determine the modal mass for each mode. So what we do is we take our mass matrix, we know our mode shapes, okay, and so you pre-multiply by the transpose of the mode shape times by our mass matrix, times by the mode shape, and I get value for M1, and I could do the same for that process for M2. It's quite useful to revise matrix um, multiplication, okay, when you're doing this stuff. Obviously, um, it's quite easy when you're doing this to actually take these two first. You do this, multiplied together, plus this multiplied together, okay, for the first term, and then this multiplied together, plus this multiplied together for the second term. Okay, and then obviously you end up with a, a vector and a vector, Okay, and you can multiply those two plus those two, and that gives you a value. We'll go through an, another example, um, possibly in the tutorial, where we'll do that by hand. So you end up getting two modal masses, and you can do the same process for your k's. Okay, we get two modal um, stiffnesses: kr, k1, and k2. We rescale the modal masses, so we take our mode shapes and we divide by the square root of each of our m terms. So for x1, we divide by m1, the square root of m1, and we get this is our mode shape, and that is our mode shape. Notice that these are still valid for the mode shapes we found earlier. Okay, they're still the same thing in terms of relative motion. And if, you set, if you set this, if you multiply this, um, or you divide 
um, this term by 0.268, you'll get 1 here. And you divide this term by 0.268, you'll get 0.732, which is the mode shape we had before. Okay? So you end up getting the same thing. Um, uh, it's the same relative motion. It's just that one of them isn't scaled to be 1. You just rescaled it. And that helps. Okay? There's our modal matrix. So we've taken our two U terms, plop them in, it's next to each other inside a matrix, and that's our modal matrix. Okay. And so we know that um, that times by M times by uh, the phi will give us the identity matrix. And you do the same thing again. It just so happens if you do, do this, you get 634, 2366, which is what our omega squared terms were in the previous uh, when we're doing solving those problems. And obviously, the equation that we have, you have uh, you know, m times by phi times by q, OK, because that's the mx bit. You pre-multiply the whole lot, the whole equation, by the transpose of phi. And obviously, the force on one side hasn't been dealt with. But obviously, if we pre-multiply the whole equation, the forces will also be pre-multiplied by phi. So you have to take the transpose of phi. Transpose of a matrix, basically, the diagonal stays the same. You swap the terms on the other side of the diagonal, OK? And obviously, um, P1 is only being applied to mass 1, OK? And 0 is being applied to mass 2. So you go through, you can solve. Um, you get 0 0.6, uh, 460 times by P1 and minus 0 0.888 times by P2. But obviously, P1 and P2, uh, sorry, P1 is, um, is uh, 10 uh, sine of uh, 6 hertz times by T, or 2 pi times 6. So we end up with the first equation, mod um, modal equation, OK? So this is in terms of mode 1. <coughs> and then you can do the same thing for the second one to get the second mode equation, which I haven't shown. But basically, we want to try and solve this. What we've done is I've made a substitution. Okay? We, know that, uh, we know that this is uh, going to be a sinusoid. And here, I've actually, instead of cosine omega t plus phi, I've dropped it into the complex plane, just for the sake of argument. We know back in chapter 2, ages ago, that if you've got a uh, sinusoid of motion, okay, that can be represented by the real part of a complex exponential. And so my P1, my applied force is a sinusoid, okay, with amplitude of 10. Okay. And if I set Q to be um, big Q1, because we know it's going to oscillate, and differentiate is necessary, we get the following from mode 1. So you end up with this equation. Okay. So we've replaced P and Q big, with big P and big Q. Okay, the E, J, omega, T's drop out, and you end up finding a value for Q1. So that's um, little Q1 in a sense. And for mode 2, we've, uh, there's the equation. Apply the same uh, logic, and you get Q2. So we've got two values. We've got minus 5.84 times 10 to the minus 3, and we've got minus 9.4 times 10 to the minus 3. Those are the values for Q, and obviously we have to multiply them by phi, okay, which is there, to get our values for x1 and x2, which is the displacement of oscillation, okay, our magnitude of oscillation, um, for uh, that applied force. And we can see that if you go through the process, you get 5.66 times 10 to the minus 3 for x1, and point, uh, point 6 .7, minus 6.72 times 10 to the minus 3 meters for um, mass 2. Now, if I was to, so there's my um, first mode and second mode, OK, in terms of the Q values, my modal vectors, Q1 and Q2. And if I was to take a number of different driving frequencies, that was at 6 hertz, OK? So if we look at, this is the values for Q, the modal response. If we took 6 hertz, you see that we get those two values that we found. I could plot it for a bunch of different driving frequencies, and you get the, same, the following thing. So obviously, you can see that one natural frequency at 4 hertz and you can see that um, the value for Q1 goes off to infinity, OK, and then comes back from minus infinity. And then at 7.7 .7 hertz, which is the other natural frequency, Q2 goes off to minus infinity and then comes back from positive infinity. You can see. And so obviously at this point, we've got this, uh, sorry, 6 hertz here. That's, that's where we were. That's for the values we found. Now what I can do is I can plot the same thing in terms of response in X, so the displacement. And you can see quite clearly that if, with no damping, if you excite the system at 4 hertz, 
we end up with them both going off to um, positive infinity. And then as you go up to 7.7 .7 hertz, again, they both go off to infinity. And we were at 6 hertz, which is where our displacements were. So that's the amplitude of the displacement, okay?